we want you to prove to us that what you're preaching, can you also walk the talk, you know? Welcome, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 482, with Mr. Misael Lopez Cardozo. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder. Everything we're doing at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts, no matter where they come from or what they are. If you want to know about everything we have going on, hop over to whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub. It's also the easiest way to find our products. Now the code, PODCAST15, that's going to save you 15% off everything. Everything for the show is on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week. The entire purpose behind everything we do is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation, if you want to help us out, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, grab a book from Amazon, leave a review on Google or Facebook or Amazon or anywhere that makes sense, or support the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's the place to go. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. And for $5, you get a new podcast episode. For $10, you get a video version of that episode. And there's blog posts and other stuff going up all the time. Bottom line, if you like this show, you're probably going to like what we're putting up there. Over the years, we've been really fortunate to get to talk to people who have spent time not only training, but on screen. Our guest today found historical fencing and then found himself on set at some of the biggest TV shows that have ever been done. Shows that I know this community loves, and I'm not going to ruin it by telling you what those shows are. We had a wonderful conversation, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing it. So here we go. Mr. Lopez Cardozo, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi. Yeah. Appreciate it being here. Hey, thanks for coming cool. on. Thanks for your willingness. Yeah. You know, we, we, we might have some folks listening who know you by name. I, I bet we have even more folks who know you by face. And I'm sure we're going to get into all that stuff. People are probably scratching, some people scratching their head going, what? Who is this? What are you talking about? And Who's that guy? Yeah. 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 Um, the bold guy with the plaited beard. <laughs> that, that's, that's a, a great way to describe it. I've got a number of pictures in front of me that, that came in. And uh, some of them are really intimidating. <laughs> do, people, do people shy away from you on the street? Uh, well, it happens, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I have a lot of different looks. So uh, if I go out anonymously, then uh, yeah, I let just my beard, I just let it loose. And I change a little bit of my clothing. I put on my flat cap and uh, sometimes even my glasses and I just look like a, look like a professor. So I, yeah, but my normal look is basically, yeah, what some people would say, distinctive kind of Viking look, you know, short sure. head shaved and then the big plaited beard. and. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, I always have to, apparently this stare what I always uh, hear. So I always try to, you know, smile a little bit more. And uh, yeah, but it's like the first impression. Sometimes, yeah, I hear it a lot. Like, mm -hmm. okay, grumpy guy, maybe you should just, uh, <laughs> you know, avoid this guy, otherwise I'm gonna get into trouble. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I always say when people say, "Oh, you look so grumpy," I say, uh, I always say like my face feels most comfortable this way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not so bad. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very chill, uh, chill guy. So, uh, but yeah, I have this uh, this look, and uh, it's also the look that, uh, in a sense, uh, partially, uh, yeah, uh, helps me uh, support myself and my, my livelihood. Yeah. You know, so it's like. Uh, Do you remember the first time you were recognized? You mean on the streets? Yeah. Well, it's 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 funny because um, you know that old movie in year two thousand from the Techno Viking. Does that ring a bell at all? I mean, that doesn't. Is a, I'm sorry. Doesn't? Well, no. trust me. If people now hear it, like the Techno Viking, it loads of people will remember the Techno Viking. It's actually the most uh, watched, I think, a YouTube movie on whole of YouTube. So, and there was this guy who was basically a, a German dude who was dancing and uh, yeah, he looked like a Viking and he got in some problems and some guy uh, filmed that and that became like a, like a, 
you know, he became the techno Viking. It was a huge, huge thing. It's just a small video clip of a guy dancing, but it was pretty cool. You should check it out later. And people always think that I'm the techno Viking, and that has been going on. So in the beginning, people recognized me while I'm not the guy. So they rec- mistaken me for uh, the wrong person. And it still, it still happens. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until the point that I actually uh, thought, okay, you know, I, I had a T-shirt that says on the back, no, I'm not the techno Viking. You know, I got four <laughs> shirts of it because I got so so tired of it and started to hate this guy. And then later on, uh, yeah, I, I, I got uh, people start uh, connecting with me for uh, uh, trans uh, parties, you know, where uh, for side trans parties and uh, looking for uh, techno Viking lookalike because this is already 20 years ago. And in the end, I said, no, get away from me, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Later on, I thought, okay, you know, if I can beat him, just join him. So in the end, I became sort of the techno Viking because I started basically doing, uh, you know, like that video clip, doing the dance moves on a big stage for 20,000 people. So, but that was the first time actually that I got recognized, but for the wrong, you know, not for me, but actually as looking like somebody. And for Game of Thrones as an actor, yeah, I think that's already, uh, I think uh, 2000, uh, 2014 when it really, really started, I think. Yeah. But before that, uh, yeah, here in Holland, most people already knew me because I've been in the newspapers and on TV a lot with my uh, historical fencing uh, yeah, stuff. <laughs> right. I mean, my club and, uh, you know, doing demonstrations and, you know, lectures and seminars. And, uh, yeah, so uh, people already kind of kind of knew. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the movie career that I started, uh, like, uh, five years ago, six years ago, that of course increased a little, uh, yeah, in Holland with uh, the recognizability, or how you call that in English. Yeah, how'd you get into movies? I mean, it, everybody. Let me let me preface that we've had a number of folks from film, from television, mm-hmm. come on the show. Yeah, but there isn't one path that these people ended up doing film and TV. They they no. all end up there in a different way. So I'm curious, what was your way? My way was uh, a bet. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to be, yeah, if I still make it as the next big action hero on silver screen, then everybody will know in the end. He just got there because he took the bet. Oh, which bet we're talking about? Well, I I do a lot of lectures about uh, visualization and uh, about uh, visualizing uh, that's what you want in life. And uh, visualizing is materializing. And and I do a lot of lectures on it and uh, seminars also internationally now. And it's it's pretty cool. But for a lot of people, this is just a lot of mumbo, mumbo jumbo. You know, there's a lot of stuff written on it. And, uh, you know, you like you have the book, uh, the, the Secret, something that I never, never read in my life. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have all these kind of books, you know, that's about the visualization process and how to basically get done in your, in your life. And uh, for me, that never really, uh, you know, I never did anything with that. I just did what I needed to do in my life. But uh, I realized after, uh, you know, I, I was a professional musician. Uh, I was a professional artist. Uh, I wanted to become one of the best sword fighters in the world, which was like a childhood dream. I don't know why, you know, maybe because of the old movies, Willow and, you know, even Star Wars or whatever. You know, I always had a dream, you know, I want to be a cool sword fighter and i want to be able to ride horses and you know and i and i would be even cooler if i could make my money with it you know but yeah uh even if you want to be a professional uh, musician you know it's like uh, everybody who is a musician would like to make his money with it and if you're an artist you know you want to uh sell your art and make money with it but it's often a really huge problem because you 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 have a talent but uh, you also uh, unfortunately, for creative people, they often don't have really a good business sense. So it is pretty difficult to to to, you know, really sustain yourself and uh, pay your rent and you know have live off of something that is your hobby, for instance. So you end up with a nine to five job uh, and having, for instance, a skill set on the side. And um, and for me, uh, yeah, I also had a big uh, company and I, I did a lot of different stuff. And then I realized, you know, uh, when people were struggling, uh, so a lot of people struggling that had really uh, talent for something like either musicians or painters, and they still, and they would really like to make the step, you know, from uh, doing their nine to five job and then go professional with their hobbies, but didn't had no idea how, how, how to make that, that transition. 
And I, I encountered a lot of people uh, kind of dealing with that and either being unhappy uh, with their job or maybe reasonable happy with their job, but just unhappy with the fact that they had a lot of creativity. But yeah, I mean, they were burned out after uh, you come home, you know, and yeah, then you still have to go to your, uh, uh, you have to paint or you have to make something, you know. So it's, and uh, yeah, I started kind of advising on the thought process and I realized, okay, uh, I actually have already changed my stars around five times and been able to make my money with whatever I set my mind on. And, uh, and I just assumed that everybody is able to do that. And I realized not everybody's able to do that. So I started kind of helping other people out, uh, achieving their dreams. So as a, as a, as, as a coach, so, uh, so back to basic, uh, where we were starting off, uh, my students told me, okay, you're doing all these lectures and all this stuff on mindset and visualization, and, but what are you still doing? I mean, is there something that you want to do? Like something, I mean, uh, we want you to prove to us that what you're preaching, can you, can you, can you also walk the talk, you know? And uh, so, and they didn't believe in it because we had this discussion in the locker room, you know, with some young guys and... Uh, and they, uh, yeah, they wanted to do certain things. And, you know, one guy was dreaming really big what he wanted to achieve. And everybody was burning him down. Like, you will never be able to do that, and blah, blah, blah. And I hear, overheard that conversation. And I said, well, you can do whatever the hell you want in your life. You know, you have only one life. But whatever you want, set your mind to it. You'll be able to achieve it. And this should not be a rhetorical kind of comment, you know, that everybody just can say or you just accept it as the truth or you just think it's completely, uh, yeah, uh, bull****. But in the end, they came up with a challenge for me. And that challenge was, I said, okay, so give me a challenge and I will prove to you that the visualization process that I've been using all my life actually is working. And that was the bet. And they said, okay, we want you to become a movie star. And I said, okay, uh, well, that's going to be something else. Um, and of course, I've been performing, you know, doing sword fight shows and all this stuff, but it's not, not exactly uh, the same, you know. And I didn't have no agent. I didn't have no acting experience. So I told them, uh, okay, let me think about this thing then. And uh, a week later, I came back to them. And I made a, a bet with 150 students, 10 bucks each. And I said, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to be a movie star. And they all laughed. And I said, well, why you guys want the impossible to prove to me what is, you know, like the, the impossible thing. And you guys said, you know, so now we're going to make the bet. So they said, okay, cool. And we bet 10 bucks each. So there will be like uh, 150 students, 1500, $1,500 or 1500 euros. Bam, in my pocket, if I would pull it off and I would lose nothing if I would fail, you know, but I would then prove that my visualization process didn't work. So that was the fun. And I, uh, in the end said, okay, you know, they said, give me a time, give me, a, give us a time schedule in which you're going to achieve it. I said, it's good. In two years, I'm going to be either in Vikings, Game of Thrones or Star Wars. And they all had to laugh. And uh, they said, that's no freaking way you're going to be able to pull that off. So, um, and that's what I did. And I lost the bet because it took me two years and four months, but I got two out of three. Wow. Okay. Story. Um, <laughs> there's so many places that we can, we can take that. Here, here's where I want to go first, though. Yeah. Most people who are going to set a goal, I want to be in movies, right? That, that yeah. whole thing. They're not going to pick such large, well-known franchises. They're going to try to get in, you know, something smaller they're going to aim for just barely over the goal line yeah that's and you did not does. do that you set your i never you know that. this is the cliche of of aim for the stars if you miss you'll at least hit the moon it is like i've been doing business all my life you know and it's just pitch high and stick to your price that's basically that's the golden rule and the other golden rule is no fear of loss and if you can master those both which is very difficult and also understand that you will never ever be able to really sell a product you will only be able to sell yourself and with yourself you can sell your product uh then you are ready further than 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 most people you know in the comprehension of how, how business works but also in relationship to ah and this sounds maybe very floaty or uh, spiritual uh but like, let's say quantum mechanics. I mean, in the quantum world, everything is possible. You know, there's no mass. There's just energy, you know, protons, electrons, neutrons. They're, they don't have any really any, any mass. There's more nothingness than that there actually is something, you know. So, you know, thinking about that, uh, 
you know, you, you can determine a, a, a lot of stuff yourself. And I believe that you have, in a sense, a radiance, let's say, uh, really like a circle of energy that you radiate. And in the end, you know, people come into your life and, uh, yeah, that, that it doesn't resonate or it resonates only for a small bit and then you kind of move out of your life. But in the end, when you really know what you want, you start collecting also more people around you with the same energy and that circle becomes bigger and you feel that in that circle, everybody's a part of that circle is starting to evolve exactly on the same time. Cool is happening in everybody's lives at the same time there's this uh yeah this this uh causality or how you call it is it's, it's just just weird 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 stuff but there are actually patterns and you know i'm not maybe uh, i'm not a religious guy and maybe in the sense i'm a spiritual guy i don't even know if i'm really a spiritual guy i'm more like a i'm more like a physics guy so let's say I'm more leaning towards physics and quantum physics, you know, but I believe in that world that with your mindset, you know, a lot of stuff is, uh, is possible. And yeah, I have just trying to, well, in this case with the bet, you know, try to prove that uh, it, 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 actually, it actually works and it's possible. And therefore you have to aim high. And a lot of people, they aim low because it's, you know, it's the same as a guy, for instance, you know, you're in a bar and you see a very, very pretty girl, you know, very, very pretty girl. And, and in your mind, that is the girl you want to approach. But you have fear. You have fear of loss, you know, fear of maybe, you know, she's whatever. You're going you're gonna to make stories in your head. And that's what everybody does in every situation. You encounter something, somebody, you're going to make stories in your head. And these stories don't benefit uh, no, no one, especially not the person thinking them because they're never really positive in the end you know so you see a mediocre uh, pretty girl in your opinion and then it's going to be safer to maybe to approach that girl but in to those but they're both girls and you just created a story and you think okay i'm not worth subconsciously that beautiful woman and i don't you know what I mean? But for somebody else, that other woman might be the pretty girl, you know? So it's just in your head that you just make stories and you have uh, fear that is completely based based on, on nothing. And if you translate it, for instance, the situation to, to, let's say, martial arts, I mean, if you would take, uh, I got an oriental uh, friend of the Chinese guy, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a kung fu dude, and uh, he, he's, very, uh, he's very skilled. Uh, but if he sees one of our bouncers at the door in a discotheque, like these huge guys, you know, they've been working out and uh, they're massive, like 100, uh, well, you guys don't do kilograms, but okay, like big, big dudes, 120 kilograms, I don't know how many pounds that is. Like uh, two, 275. Yeah, whatever. Then this, 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 this friend of mine, he's very thin, you know, he weighs half, but when he sees these bouncers, he automatically drops his guard and think, okay, these guys are slow. Uh, they cannot generate a lot of low frequency impact. They can, uh, I mean, I'm going to be faster than those guys. So he already feels uh, light, you know. He feels like something is, you know, like I can take these guys easily. While we as Europeans see this huge guy and, and we think, oh my God, you know, I don't want to get in a fight with this guy, you know, because he's going to just, uh, he's just going to, he's just going to f*** me up, you know, so I'm not going to go there, you know. So it's completely the other way around. But when we see, for instance, a really scrawny little guy bouncing at a discotheque, at least me for probably also for American would be the same. You know, you expect a huge guy and there's like a really small guy standing there, really skinny. You think, man, what's he going to do? You know, I'm going to take him out like that. But my Chinese friend, when he would look at that guy, you think, oh, my God, that guy is small. He's very agile. He's going to be fast. So I have to be really on my guard, you know, but it's all bull. It is just your perception and you creating stories in your head, which they're based on, on nothing. And nine or 10 times they're based just out of irrational fear and combinations of what might happen. And, um, and that's why people either don't take really big leaps or important decisions, or they will go and play, uh, go for safe. So even if they step out of their comfort zone, they're still gonna, still gonna play uh, safe. So. Yeah, and if you ask me, okay, well, you want to be a movie star, what am I going to say? I'm going to play in a TV show somewhere as an extra in, in, uh, in some soap series in Holland. No, 
screw that. I mean, no, of course, I'm going to think big and I'm going to just visualize that. And it took me a year also to visualize it. every day, 50 minutes under the shower, just visualizing how Steven Spielberg is uh, just, uh, you know, wiping his own ass, you know, on the toilet with a toilet paper, you know, and is running out, needs to go to the store and he's behind the shopping trolley, throwing in toilet paper, dialing his 10 friends. Because in the end, you know, these are just people, you know, so... And if you would sit with somebody like that, or you sit with Jerry Bruckheimer, or you sit with one of these big shots, I mean, would you lose yourself? Would you be able to see this person as another person, or you're going to put him on a pedestal and you kind of disappear? Or how, how would your mindset be? You know, because in the end, you're just creating stories. The problem is these guys are not up there on some floating cloud, you know, with all their millions in the bank and they're kind of gods where you can never be or you can never go. This is this. Is bull- these guys need to go also to the toilet, you know, like, and they also uh, have their friends and they go to parties and they have their problems with their wives and they, they, uh, you know, they're exactly like us. They're just a little, maybe further down the line with a certain trajectory. But once you really understand that and you take these people from, that's what I do in this visualization process, take them from the pedestal and also raise yourself up and think, okay, I could be one of those guys and really start believing that, which takes really time uh, and acceptance because you think, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to pull that off. Uh, but once you start uh, kind of believing in your own bull because at the moment, yeah, you're not there yet, then the universe will start figuring out a way to achieve it. And you don't even have to know how you're going to do it. It's just going to happen. And that's been going on all my life, more as an automatic system. And that's why I now kind of coach other people uh, to help them on their path to do things. And I'm still not there where I want to be because I started this trajectory uh, like six years ago. And I'm absolutely not yet where I, I, I want to be, but I did in five years, I think more than most people did in 20. And so I, I like shortcuts. I like things to, to, to go fast. You know, I mean, I have only one life to live. And I did a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, just like a computer game, I know, okay, I've got so many days, and then I'm going to croak. And I just want to get maximum out of it and work with maximum efficiency. And, uh, yeah, that's basically what my mindset is. Where did this mindset come from? Did you figure this out? Was this taught to you? No. I, uh, that is just, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know. No, I had nobody uh, to coach me. I had to go through... Uh, trial by error and uh and of course yeah maybe things now uh, yeah I'm, I'm 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 47 you know i'm already uh i'm already getting there an old dude so yeah maybe uh wisdom or you know certain insights and algorithms you start figuring out certain patterns and uh and of course i had also people in my life you know that kind of you know they they they, they talk about certain things and you start thinking okay and then you hear something there and you start making correlations and yeah, you know, I mean, I also, for instance, an acting coach, and I learned a lot from him, for instance, about acting, but also about the focus and mindset and on all the stuff and stuff that I have been doing already all my life. But he, I was really able to uh, explain basically on a, on a whiteboard, you know, with a pen, with a non-permanent marker exactly for instance the processes that go on in, in your head in certain situations and for me that was really fascinating because then you see you know everybody has the same everybody has the same issues uh and there are uh solutions or methods to basically um uh have more to make uh, how do you say that make more more use out of uh um be more efficient. That's mm. let's let's say it in achieving achieving your goals. That's basically. Now you mentioned sword fighting, and, and you have students, and yeah, you know this is part of the persona that you have that is appealing in these movies. How'd you mm. get there? I mean, you talked about being a, a, a young kid and wanting to be a professional sword fighter, but you you did it, so you you've you followed that path, but. At some point, somebody had to teach you. How did you find sword work? Yeah, that's also, uh, that's even maybe a weirder, weirder story. And uh, so I had, I had this dream already as a kid, you know, and uh, that, that I, you know, would like to be able to uh, be 
a sword fighter. So knowing, be knowledgeable about working with the sword. But there was nothing like historical martial arts around, of course. And um, so, yeah, and you're, of course, being fed with a lot of uh, Hollywood crap, you know, concerning Eastern martial arts. I don't want to say crap, but I mean, the crap generally, you know, just, uh, you know, you get bombarded with Asian martial arts, which was very, very cool, especially in the 80s. So, and, um, and so I automatically was drawn to Eastern martial arts and starting to do that. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And I've been doing that for, uh, yeah, for a long time. And, uh, but what I wanted to do is actually, uh, for instance, learn how to sort for like a medieval knight. But yeah, I mean, when you look at, 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 at movies, for instance, you, uh, and I mean, uh, when I say, uh, uh, when I say crap, I don't mean like uh, versus Asian martial arts. I mean, actually, generally, like with the fight geography, you know, where, the way I look at things now, you know, uh, fight geography versus, let's say, uh, realism, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But you had Asian martial arts, but you had medieval movies. But if you look at uh, any movies, uh, or even now, still today, uh, if you look at um, Asian martial arts, you see uh, 300 uh, flick flags and saltos and whatever you you, uh, you call it in English, you know, like very athletic dexterity moves and they can toss these throwing stars, you know, like uh, 500 in a second, you know, and with a blow dart, they can uh, hit your left testicle on a three kilometers distance, you know, and if you look at medieval movies, you just see clumsy knights in shining armor, almost, uh, you know, collapsing under the weight. And just hacking away at each other, and the uh, yeah, strongest arm in the end uh, will be victorious. You know, and that's how uh, Hollywood basically kind of uh, screwed up the perception of uh, Western martial arts. And uh, and uh, you cannot blame them because there, there was not much knowledge anymore because all these manuscripts that were written between the 13th and the 17th century it kind of all uh, went into private collections and museums and yeah, actually in 17th century, nobody actually really knew how people were fighting in medieval times because all these manuscripts written by these uh, masters, they, they, they were not really accessible anymore. And it's only now, I, I don't know if you noticed, but they tried to revive uh, Western martial arts or historical European martial arts, let's put it that way, um, already three times. So, uh, yeah, they, in the 1800s, there were people doing transcriptions and in the, in the fencing clubs, they already tried to bring that back, the historical fencing in the 1900s, they did it, but in both times it just failed. So even the f people in the fencing clubs were uh, apparently uh, didn't catch on. So, And the third wave, which is actually now and only due to internet and being able, uh, you know, uh, easy accessible transcriptions of medieval manuscripts, PDF that's are online, uh, books that are being published, you know, we now have basically reconstructed the whole biomechanics of the German and the uh, uh, well, at least a German tradition. I mean, yeah. If I'm, uh, if 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 Hima is are listening, and you do Italian and Fiori and Marazzo and stuff, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, let's say uh, the the Italian stuff has a little bit more. Um, uh, there's more interpretation possible. So uh, the German tradition is very very clear. That's why I like the German tradition uh, more because it's just very 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 specific. And uh, all the German fencers, they're basically on the same page. You might have little differences in you know, interpretation, but in the end, you know, it is, we basically know, let's say for 97%, we could say really with accuracy, we are kind of uh, right on the money again. So uh, like we were fencing in medieval times. So uh, yeah, that has been uh, now only the third wave kind of survived. And n now it has become, it, it caught on. And maybe at the right moment, you know, also with the, all the period movies that are coming out and all the stuff, and now also the movies, the 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 yeah, the, the the movie industry is kind of picking it up and understanding. Mm, okay, maybe we should keep the stuntman to do the stunts and start really using historical fencers to oversee the historical stuff that is happening. Because at the moment, you know, uh, or at least how it was, and I think, yeah, it's it's still. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the case now is that uh, yeah, stuntmen are doing all the all the sword sword work, and either they come, they have some experience in uh, Asian martial arts, uh, 
or they're just stunt guys, you know, very handy with just moving uh, swords around. But it's not historical fencing. Historical fencing has a very specific uh, visual uh, flavor to it. It's, it's very distinctive and it's really different, for instance, than, let's say, the classic uh, classical uh, Bushido, for instance, with, uh, with the katana. It, the, the biomechanics is completely different. You might think, oh, well, a sword is a sword, but that's actually... Uh, not the case because katana is a single-edged weapon and basically a saber and was like a side arm for uh, samurai which were actually archers and uh, a long sword is a double-edged uh, weapon which is also about uh, well at least uh, 25 centimeters longer average than a katana and uh, weighs uh, exactly the same so you have more length but uh, yeah and in the classical bushido you have nine strikes with a katana but you have 28 uh, biomechanic different strikes uh, with a long sword due to these double edges which are basically uh, used and that means just biomechanically it looks different and technically it's also executed different so, and it deserves a place in the movie industry that's basically absolutely it. absolutely and I, I think when we look at shows like game of thrones and others that are investing in accuracy historical accuracy people are responding to that whether or not they realize that it's important, I think it impacts the overall experience that we have when we watch these things. Yeah, I don't know. Game of Thrones is a uh, an example that that was, I think, the show which had really the highest budget to spend and uh, right the 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 worst worst sword fighting ever. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I, I took it for granted that if you were involved, that it was it was no, a, I was acting quality. in that. People always think that uh, I did all the uh, choreography and stuff, but I was just uh, an actor. And uh, in the in the TV show, I did uh, try to advise on the historical uh, the historical stuff, but uh, and they tried to get me also uh, uh, on board. But yeah, the it's like the the fight choreography, for instance, uh, was done by uh, I don't know his name, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, for the HEMA guys, as from an historical perspective, I mean, it's spectacular. It's nice to see. And if you have no knowledge of uh, historical fencing, then it's totally fine. But uh, so uh, I don't mean it in an offensive way, but it would be the same as you are a tennis player, right? And, uh, and you really love tennis. That is your sport. And then there's a movie in which tennis plays kind of a key role, you know, and everything you see is just wrong. Yeah, then in the end, you know, uh, yeah, you are, the, yeah, what you're going to do? You're going to watch or you're going to just, uh, you know, it's time to grab your beer every time a sword fight starts and you kind of slowly uh, get annoyed, uh, annoyed by it. I don't get annoyed because I know how the movie industry works and, uh, you know, and I respect uh, the fight choreographers and also especially their attempt to kind of reconstruct, uh, you know, historical martial arts. But if you don't have any knowledge of it, you know, it's just like driving uh, a, a race car with uh, not having any driving license. I mean, maybe you in the end, you were able to park that vehicle somewhere in a parking lot, but you're not going to do crazy stuff, you know? Mm. So uh, that, that, that's basically it. And uh, yeah, and I'm, uh, and, and that could be easily confused. I had it also in interviews, you know, okay, so you are the guy that know, so you're, you're like, you're arrogant because you think you know better, you know, but it's, it's not like that. You know, it's just, we, we are historical fencers. That's what we do. So when we look at a movie, you know, which is historical, then we would like to see historical fencing, but it's not happening. So it's logic that the community in that sense is a little bit frustrated with the fact that uh, we do not uh, see uh, the, the, the historical fencing back on, on the silver screen at, the, at this moment. And uh, yeah, I totally agree. The only difference between me and them is maybe that I don't get annoyed because I know how the movie in industry works, but uh, whatever I can do uh, to help or to advise, and that's what I'm doing now more, uh, yeah, is to, uh, to at least uh, make uh, directors and the production companies aware that there is actually a lot of knowledge about historical fencing and that it is often much, much cooler, the content of the historical manuscripts then a fight choreographer can just conjure up or, you know, uh, you know, improvise on the spot. There's a lot of stuff you can take literally from the manuscript, which would be amazingly cool to do in a movie, but it's just not done. Do you think that's going to change? Yeah. How soon? Yeah, when I'm going to make sure it's going to change. <laughs> well, you know, I'm working on my own movie right now, and uh, 
and uh, I uh, that is a contemporary movie. And uh, yeah, it's basically. Uh, can you can can you tell us about it? Yeah, a little bit. It's basically about uh, drugs, bikes, and swords, and that's going to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and not necessarily. That sounds like a pretty order. good plot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's just the average life. It's just an average lifestyle in Holland. So it's just, uh, it's, uh, yeah. So that basically, it. so it's my life, and eh? yeah. Okay. Drug and- swords and rock and roll. <laughs> when did the sword start? Um, my love for swords. You mean? Uh, when when did you start learning swords? I mean, it seems like ah, you yeah, yeah. that was actually been at the I think very the beginning. Of- yeah, this was I think I think your initial question. Yeah. Uh, how, where did I learn that stuff? Well, yeah. the thing is that um, I had no idea where to go to. I was doing Asian martial arts. And then one morning I had an epiphany. And I'm just thinking, there, should there maybe, is there, no, is there any knowledge out there how our own ancestors were fighting on the medieval battlefield and in uh, trial by combat, you know, civil, uh, civil uh, trials, you know, like, uh, well, basically how this disputes were settled and i was just wondering if there are maybe manuscripts uh maybe survived or something like that so i, I just went on internet and i uh yeah i stumbled uh, like most people i think on the the haka back then you know was uh, was with uh, john clemens which later became uh, the arma and john clemens yeah he was the first guy actually to, to write actually a book on historical fencing and so and uh, there was like a really small community in the United States were already busy with it. And uh, just really, I mean, it was just tiny, tiny stuff happening already. And, and there were sources. And that for me, it was like, wow, we got like historical sources that basically describe the fencing theory, how they were basically conducted and how the biomechanically and technically uh, a sword was used in, in the 14th and 16th century and i'm like whoa you know so i started studying that and uh yeah very soon after i realized okay you know i may have i need to make a transition because you know the reality is that's what i always wanted and i was doing asian martial arts because there was nothing else you know i i i was not aware of anything uh, going on so i kind of traveled around and i was doing reenactment also you know as a fun but i had no idea what the hell i was doing you know Reenact, you know, just dressing up in the in your armor and doing all these uh, battles and stuff, and uh, just uh, kicking the shit out of other people, which was a lot of fun. But um, yeah, and I did a lot of shows, and uh, the shows were in the end uh, getting uh, uh, popular, and I was already making uh, some money with that on the side uh, when I was around like twenty, twenty, twenty-two, and um, yeah, and then I. Uh, then I stumbled on these manuscripts and then I just started uh, reading and stealing and, you know, how is this guy doing that? And then, yeah, apparently I had a, I don't know, like a talent talent for it. So after, I think, four years, three and a half, around that, when I was traveling around, I, my, my skills were, yeah, I, I think I was already ahead of most people and... Uh, yeah, and I had nowhere to go. So what I was just doing is just, you know, getting getting my hands on these manuscripts and transcribing and analyzing and trying to figure st- stuff out and also really uh, unlearning what I had learned from Asian martial arts because biomechanically we're all the same. You know, we get two legs, two arms, and a lock is a lock, and then on the, you know, an arm lock is an arm lock, an arm bar is an arm bar, and a kick is a kick, you know, and a throw is a throw. But there were really... Uh, significant differences which were uh, some ways even unlogical i mean stuff that was from an asian martial arts perspective very logic suddenly became unlogic in in the european uh, in the european tradition and and i was confusing in the beginning and then i started realizing okay this is like really a different language you know we're we're speaking and if i want to make a transition i I have to unlearn uh, that and i have to start learning this you know because in the end it's not the blood of some samurai f- flowing through my veins i mean that's the reality of things you know i got uh you know i'm i'm uh i'm from holland and i'm closest you know to uh to, you know, to the german border and it used to be of course uh, the roman uh, i mean it was just one uh the holy roman empire i would call that uh, but we were just, that was yeah. just one big big chunk 
and uh, yeah, so I'm closer to the German tradition, of course. And yeah, even now, if I read uh, historical manuals, the original manuals, uh, I can read it fluently because it's medieval German is really close to contemporary Dutch. I cannot read medieval Dutch. It is impossible, but I can read fluent uh, medieval German, which is also kind of funny. So how languages uh, develop. So I, uh, yeah, I just had a nudge for it. And then also uh, these epiphanies, you know, when you're like training and trying to figure out, because I had a, in the end a partner, Kenneth Smolders, which I started, uh, you know, training with. And uh, we were training three times, four times a week just with the historical manuals and really, you know, trying to invent the wheel by ourselves nine or ten times because there, you know, we were already pretty high level. And in the end, you know, Everybody was just shrugging his shoulders like, oh, we don't have no freaking clue. And we also went like, we have no freaking clue. So in the end, we were just all over the world. We had these groups that were researching and trying to kind of reconstruct the, the historical, uh, historical martial arts. And uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, you're just busy and you think, okay, you know, according to what I call the black hole mechanics, you know, like you see one plate in a manuscript with some text and the next one. And yeah, but what happens in between because like two dimensional pictures, you know, so how we have no masters. That, that is the problem with Western martial arts maybe versus, or let's say historical martial arts versus uh, Japanese martial arts. Uh, that's at least the argument that uh, people sometimes use like, okay, Japanese martial arts, they have an heritage, you know, and it's being the sensei is training his student and we still have masters and then that student becomes a master and he's training. But yeah, that is true. And we don't have masters because they all croaked uh, like 500 years ago. So yeah, uh, so mm, that is maybe uh, on one hand a problem. On the other hand, we have the historical sources which are very, very clear. And, uh, you know, we're, we're therefore close to the source. Well, in Japanese martial arts, it's, yeah, it becomes in the end slightly diluted, you know, like, like wine, you know, like you just pour in water because how do you know that what you're training now, let's say you're doing Katori Shinturyu, one of the oldest Japanese sword fight forms, you know, uh, if, what you are training now in that dojo is exactly what the samurais were doing. I mean, I remember doing Katori Shintoryu and I asked my sensei, I said, can I have a look at the historical sources and are there any transcriptions of it? No. Uh, why not? Just because they're not. Uh, okay. Uh, so how do I know what, I, what, we, what you are teaching me is actually uh, how the old samurais were fighting? Well, this is how my teacher taught me, and this is what I'm teaching you, and this is this is the tradition. And I'm like, okay, uh, well, that's not very satisfying, but okay. And uh, so I kept on going, but yeah, in the end, I was just walking around, swinging a uh, boken, you know, wooden stick around, doing katas, and uh, yeah, you had these people, you know, with uh, first done and uh, you know even higher, and very pretentious they thought they were sword fighters and you know like the descendants almost of the, the samurai you know but they never sparred you know they never really pressure tested themselves i mean they pull their katana out just like i did out of your saya you know and you have an aluminium training sword and maybe lucky you have to steal one and maybe you do some tatami cutting but that's it <clears throat> Well, we know from the samurai, they were fighting and they were sparring and they were training and they were kicking out of each other. How else are you going to be able to prepare for combat? Otherwise, just false sense of security. You know, just doing katas in a dojo. I'm sorry, it's not going to make you a sword fighter. You know, I mean, well, let's define sword fighter as in the tradition of historical fencing, uh, either in Japan or in Europe. You know what it means? You know, you're going in combat, you got a guy in front of you with a sword, and he's going to try to kick out of you, and you're going to try to kick out of him, and you try to, well, let's say, rephrase that, you try not to get hit. That's actually the main, uh, it's the art of defense, not the art of offense, but you understand what I mean. And in historical European martial arts now, and that's the only sport, uh, and the Japanese guys are now actually following that uh, up, because there's now blacksmiths creating special... Uh, uh, steel weapons also like katanas for sparring um yeah we are uh, doing uh tournaments with steel 
and uh, with, with steel faders. And we have been doing that for, uh, for uh, quite some time. And that is still different, let's say, than you're doing, for instance, uh, kendo, you know, where you just do, uh, you have to scream the target before you hit it, you know. Uh, and there are all these rules, you know, and uh, you cannot hit lower targets, you know, like legs and stuff. You're not allowed to wrestle. You know, there's all these kind of formats and algorithms where you have to stick to. And with historical fencing tournaments, for instance, you just go in the ring. And uh, depending a little bit on the rule sets, but uh, let's say my event, there are no rules. So you just go in and uh, you stick to the historical fencing principles. And uh, whatever you want to do is cool. You want to kick, you want to get in there and grapple. You want to do a zufechten, what they called it in German. Uh, locks, kicks, throws, uh, use your sword, that I wonder, the three miracles, you know, cutting, uh, slicing and stabbing. You know, it's all good as long as you don't get hit and you hit the other guy and you score points. It is good, but it's a full contact fight. So, and that's what I like, you know, it's like the theoretical part, mm -hmm. which I also found in the Asian martial arts with the sword. Uh, we have the test cutting, which also uh, you find with uh, in Asian martial arts. Uh, but sparring, for instance, I could not find it unless I was doing kendo, which I also did for a while, but in the end uh, became uh, very boring for me because, you know, I was missing, you know, uh, a lot of reality-based things, you know. I cannot hit somebody in the legs. You cannot get in there and grab or hit the back of the, the, the sword, you know, stuff like that. So I wanted to have a feel of uh, really going completely 100% old school, you know. So I found my, my, my spot basically in historical European martial arts and also because it's my, my, my legacy, you know, it's where I come from and it's mm -hmm. what I do. So I have more, uh, yeah, a vibe with the medieval, uh, with the medieval knight, for instance, than with the samurai. And uh, yeah, that's just me personally. Yeah. And that's why I, in the end, uh, uh, yeah, started my own club after, uh, after four years. Um, I think in 2002, I... Uh, I don't know how long I was training, but in 2002, I started my own club. And then, uh, yeah, I started a new other club. And in the end, I had seven clubs throughout the Netherlands. I sold two and I have now five left. And uh, yeah, in 2008, I started traveling internationally and teach also uh, at, at international events. And then I kind of got into the advising for movies and then I kind of got into front of the camera and the end of the, yeah that is kind of kind of history mm. it seems like this path that you've been on really started at least the momentum started from this dissatisfaction with your asian training this question of is this what the samurai did and is this even going to work? It, it sounded like that really didn't fit for you. Well, yeah, that was that was one thing, and not the other. It was, of course, just uh, uh, the curiosity. Uh, sure. What was uh, if there was anything? Um, there was anything preserved? But uh, you might be right. Actually, I'm not thinking about it. But yeah, I always had a. Uh, already when I was a young kid, you know, that I, I, if I do something, I, I would like to have it uh, real, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I am a very practical, uh, I'm a very practical guy in that sense. And also when I teach, you know, people know me for a very practical uh, approach. So there's, you know, uh, even in the historical manuscripts, you know, if you look at dagger work and stuff like that, you know, and I see people doing dagger techniques, and then I say, okay, well, this is exactly what it says in historical sources, but you have to look at it in the context, you know? And when people start saying, for instance, even about my martial arts, you know, like, okay, this, uh, this is, and I ask, okay, would you do this in a real life situation? And then this person might say, you know, who is actually a he, my ist. Yeah, yeah, because these are, these are the historical techniques and, this would also work in, 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 in this contemporary age, then I would be the one, you know, that would say, uh, okay, uh, well, maybe you need a small reality check, you know, because you have to look at that technique in a specific context, in a, in a specific time era with a specific weapon, 
you know, and, you know, if you do it like this in a contemporary situation, it might not gonna play out exactly like you think is gonna, you know, go. And it's because also in my martial arts, we have a lot of, you know, armchair researchers that really are very passionate about their, uh, their art, but never had really any real life uh, conflicts or uh, really uh, ever encountered uh, violence and stuff like that. And in my case, yeah, I come from a different, different background. And I mean, I did a lot of, uh, you know, I also, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, did, I did a lot of stuff, you know, when I was younger and I also uh, was a bouncer and I, yeah, there's, mm. uh, there's a whole history, you know, of, 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 of things I, I did before I uh, uh, became uh, an historical swordsman. And I, uh, there was a time where I was confronted with, with a lot of, uh, lot of violence and, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, that taught me, taught me many things. And that, that experience I also take back again in my, in my teaching. So even in my, uh, yeah, in historical martial arts, there, there is a, a uh, it's divided in, in more the practical approach and the more the armchair uh, researchers, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, and I like to have things real. And yeah, for sure, that was lacking when I was doing Asian, uh, Asian martial arts. And I still go to events, you know, sometimes I teach or, uh, and, uh, I went uh, through to this uh, mixed martial arts event and, uh, I did a demonstration there and I went there uh, with, uh, with my long swords and my team and people were just laughing. I mean, there were all these Asian martial artists that, that saw us coming in with medieval weapons and they were like, Poo-poo. I mean, this is already a while ago. I'm talking about, uh, I think 2000, 2004, 2005. And uh, this was about doing uh, demonstrations, and uh, we 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 uh, we got second prize with our demo. I mean, we lost against a bunch of guys that were flying through the air and doing all these really uh, acrobatic uh, stuff. But uh, I remember also there we had all these sword fighters, you know, and uh, Japanese uh, sword fighters from all these different martial arts were doing demonstrations there. And in the end. Uh, I told him, you know, let's uh, let's go in the ring and do some sparring. And I got some, and I brought gear with me. And uh, they s- said, well, I, I would like to spar, but uh, you know, and I'm a fifth done uh, shin kendo and uh, aikijutsu, this that, and, you know. But I don't have a steel sword. I only have an aluminium sword. And I said, how much did you pay for that aluminium sword? Yeah, thirteen hundred bucks. I'm like, what? And I said, well, I have a steel katana in the back of my fan. So, uh, and I mean, you can cut a lantern pole with that thing. So, uh, but it's kind of, uh, you know, it's not sharp, and, but it, the steel is really good. So you can use that. And uh, I got two fencing masks, you know. So always, I took always these, these events also as an opportunity to uh, kind of pressure test my, my, myself, you know, against uh, other, other people. And uh, that was always fun. Uh, but then I realized that, uh, you know, just by being in the ring, and fighting tournaments and winning medals, you get more at least of a reality check. I'm not saying it's the reality check because fighting with sharp steel without any protection, you know, would still, of course, psychologically be be different. But it is at least as close as you can get now in the contemporary age, you know, with very light gear, going in the ring, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, and yeah, we have also, uh, you know, you can get hurt, you know, I broke my mm. fingers a lot of times, all my ribs, you know, my collarbone and, uh, you know, cause an uh, impact, uh, yeah, you guys, of course don't do kilograms, but, uh, yeah, an average strike with a long sword for an adult is like 1300 kilograms square centimeter easily. Mm. Well, let's say an African lion bites about 550 max and a, 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 a an average sword impact is, uh, at least uh, more than twice twice as much so wow. it creates even with protection a lot of impact so it's a good pressure testing and then yeah if you then match yourself with people that have no practical experience except just doing katas and going through the doyo and understanding apparently techniques and yeah you of course you 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 yeah you lose i mean that is uh, that is uh, at least you lose a sparring bout I mean, practical experience, really doing it, you know, is still the best, uh, still the best training, I, I think. So, 
I agree. Now, with all the work that you've done with books and transcription and research, have you written anything of your own? Well, I have to say that uh, uh, no. <laughs> that is the thing. Everybody asks me when I'm going to write something. Well, yeah. Of course, I have been writing some stuff on my computer, and uh, but it's just uh, it is uh, it is work in progress. So yeah. I'm working on something. Cannot say yet what, but it's like my 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 basically my take on things. But I'm busy with a biography, and I'm also busy with a with a book. But you know, I'm a perfectionist, so I have no idea when that is going to be ready and probably sure. i'm gonna need help with that but uh yeah i think it would be good if i uh i always thought you know who, who gives who gives the reds ass if i re write anything you know there's so many people already out there writing stuff so uh, nobody's gonna be uh you know like waiting for uh, cardosa to write something but uh yeah i i, I did hear it uh, left and right you know that i should do it so I I I, I took a I, I'm, uh, I took an attempt and I'm uh, yeah I'm writing something but I have never uh, never written uh, really anything. Okay. I'm going to write for a uh, I've been asked now to write articles for uh, a new uh, concept. Uh, it's like a couple of HEMA guys are going to be publishing every time some articles. So I'm going to be on board of that. So that's going to be then my first time uh, that I'm going to at least uh, publish my 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 take and my view on certain things. So cool. people are interested, to uh, fine. And yeah, if not, also fine. Yeah, I, I would imagine the community is really interested in what your take is on things. Well, yeah, I'm the biomechanics guy. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the, the, the biomechanics, yeah, we, we have a lot of lot of issues still to overcome in our, our sports. So let's say uh, as a quick example, what, what is something that I, I, I'm working on uh, lately is, is just ba basic biomechanics and how to move your sword. I mean, we know all the techniques from the manuscripts, but how do you really move your sword from location alpha to location bravo? And how is this mathematically uh, and uh, biomechanically uh, working, you know, with the, with the kinetic energy of your weapon and the centrifugal forces, you know, the, the finger gripping pressure, for instance, the rotation, uh, the axis where everything goes through. So, and the reality is that in uh, any sports, and I mean, people should correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, yeah, people are kind of, there's like one technique of doing things. So let's say golfer, you know, most golfers, they kind of, you know, you stick to kind of the same same thing and you might develop slightly your own style, but there's a way of hitting that ball. You know, when you're a racetrack driver, there's a way to cut that corner. There are mathematical equations. At a certain moment, you have to go in there and you have to get back, you know. Everybody's doing the same, but... This one is going to be better at it, you know. But for instance, a simple open how a strike from above, from right above to left below, if you take 10 HEMA guys, they will all be doing it different, you know. So, um, and, I, uh, and I think there's just, uh, there's always one way more efficient, more faster, or, uh, you know, where you have more control, stopping power than the other, which is just biomechanically uh, more sensible than the other. But in our community, you cannot really say my way is better than your way because then I did, then you're an arrogant, uh, you know, you're an arrogant, uh, an arrogant. C so you cannot do that. So everybody's kind of hiding behind. Okay, well, this is your interpretation and this is my interpretation, you know. But from a martial perspective and from a military perspective, and if you're like, you know, a medieval knight, you're like special operation unit of your time era, you know. You should be able to take out at least 10 farmers by yourself just by the knowledge and skills that you have that those farmers do not have. You know, they have their own little subculture. But every manuscript really specifically says in the beginning, don't let, uh, if you have a responsibility of this manuscript, if you have it in your hand, don't let it fall in the hands of the, no, of the, of the commoner or the peasant because it, it, they are worth uh, less than beasts of burden. That's really how, how these nobilities we're looking at, at the normal folk which is really patronizing but yeah that's what is in the manuscript but apparently they were trying to protect uh this this ciencia this sci science you know so you were like the special operation unit but if you are a special operation unit of the time era you have to think about a lot of stuff you know i mean you have to think about economics you know you have to think about uh, energy uh preservation you have to think a lot of stuff you know so you have to be very efficient as a fighter so in the contemporary time where we practice historical uh, martial arts, uh, 
uh, I think there's not enough emphasis on basically really trying the most economic way of doing things. And that's what I'm uh, really focusing on. Now, what about the future? You know, you, you've talked about setting goals and, and achieving things. And, and I have no doubt that there are big things on the horizon that you're looking at. So I'm wondering if you're willing to share those. You mentioned a movie, but is there anything else on there? Yeah, there's a couple of things, but uh, unfortunately, I cannot, uh, I cannot okay. not disclose a, a, a lot. But uh, yeah, my, my my goals are are high, and uh, and yeah, my 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 goal, what I have in mind, is basically, even though it still sounds completely ridiculous to myself, but I mean, you have to endorse it. You know, you have to just keep repeating this. Shit, you know, and people, you know, you start believing in your own. Bull- and it's gonna happen, you know. So I should not draw a line anywhere, you know. But yeah. Uh, so what I'm visualizing now is just become new American action hero. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. So I want to bring something to the silver screen, you know, a specific face, you know, in the time of the Viking era where the Vikings are now very popular, you know. Uh, you know, I just want to bring, uh, yeah, a new character to the silver screen with a specific skill set that uh, not many people have. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, where the where the the dagger kind of cuts, you know, on both sides. One hand, uh, you know, I like to act. I've been a musician. I've been an artist. And this is where music and light, everything comes together. So I really, really enjoy that whole process of movie making. On the other hand, I really want to promote my art. So just like Steven Seagal put his Aikido on the silver screen, and Jean Claude Van Damme put his kickboxing on the silver screen, I want to put historical European martial arts on the silver screen. But I would really like to do it by not making historical movies, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It does. Because then, because then in the end, you know, I think from a marketing and I'm also a business guy, you know, like from a marketing perspective, that is the wrong, the wrong approach. Because it's not gonna, it's not gonna uh, sync, you know, with uh, the youth and the potential practitioners and stuff. Because that is just, if you make an historical period movie, it's gonna be just a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you know. And uh, that's that's basically it. So I want to make contemporary movies where you see basically the unarmed combat styles of uh, ring and like the wrestling, dagger work that they used in medieval times, and sword works. Even if it's just related to an uh, improvised weapon as a hockey stick, I don't care. But it has to be, you know, it has to be contemporary. But I mean, there's also no reason why not to put the swords in a contemporary movie because it's the movies. You can do whatever the hell you want. So therefore, I'm also working on my movie, and uh, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, it's uh, uh, drugs, bikes, and swords, basically. <laughs> and the story, and the story is pretty cool, but I cannot uh, disclose it uh, completely in the details because of uh, legal stuff. Uh, sure, I understand. Well, I'm looking forward to it. If All people right. want to find you online, website, social media, where would they go? Uh, well, I just started with that. Um, uh, uh, well, okay. My website, let's start with it. It's just my, it's amec.org. Sorry, I'm just, my brain is just going pop, 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 pop. Uh, amec.org. So, alpha mike echo kilo.org, Oscar Romeo Golf. So, that is my company, and that is the website is also in English. So, there you can find a lot of stuff. And, uh, yeah, if you go to, uh, I think, uh, swordfighting.au, it would lead because I got a lot of these earls that would lead to my, my sports club in, in Holland. It's Dutch, but I guess you got Google translated all those things. But I think amac.org, so amac with a K. Uh, yeah, that is my basically uh, my, uh, my, my company name. And for the rest, yeah, if you just go on Google and punch in my first name, Misael, like Mike India, Sierra Hotel Alpha Echo Lima. And even if you forget the two dots on the E, you will uh, probably, uh, there's only two. So Michelle Morgan, and uh, that is that's, uh, an actress. So, uh, and uh, that's my name, which apparently is also a female name. But there's only one of them. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. And I'm awesome. also on, uh, of course, on Facebook and on, uh, 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 what is it, the other one? Instagram. Instagram, yeah, of course. Yeah, and of course, we'll, we'll link all this stuff in the show notes to make it easier for people. If, uh, if yeah, and you guys should like it because I just started with the Instagram, and I, uh, yeah, I, I, I really need more followers. So okay, we'll see what me. we can do. Back me, guys, back me. We'll do what we can. Otherwise, I have to come to your house with my long sword. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, there's some people who, as threatening as that would be, uh, they they might still enjoy it. Yeah, it could be, could be, could be. I mean, who 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 gets yeah, yeah. who gets beat up by a sword? Who gets yeah, attacked by uh, a sword these days? Not very many people. It'd be a great story. No, no, no. Yeah, that would be a great story. Well, I had a great story actually. I was in a parking lot. I tell you, I not there was this this bum and he was sleeping there in his sleeping bag and I thought first you know I'm gonna just give the guy a couple of bucks and uh he was in the sleeping bag and I was actually talking to uh to a girl and uh we both had our car parked there and um and this guy was screaming from from his sleeping bag you know because we had the cars running and uh so and he was really impolite so I thought okay you know just, just you just screwed it up you know I'm not gonna give you a couple of bucks now you know so and in the end, uh, I said goodbye to the to, to the friend of mine, and she left the car. And uh, I opened the the door of my vehicle to go, and I checked the sleeping bag, and the sleeping bag was suddenly empty. And there was nobody else, and nowhere in the garage, and the guy just disappeared. And then I suddenly heard "Hey," and I turned around, and there was this guy, but he was like five meters away from me. And he had his stick in his hand. I mean, like, uh, like a like like short broomstick or whatever it was. And he was just standing there, and I'm like, okay, you know. And then I had this this Highlander. You remember that the Highlander, the movie? Yeah. yeah. You remember that's the first sword fight in the parking garage. So, but what is the thing? I just came from my club, and I had a whole bag, yeah, of wasters, which is basically training weapons in my car right next to my seat so i looked at this guy and he was just tapping this thing on the ground like he wanted to f- me up you know and i just went in with my hands and i actually remember like switching i first thought i'm gonna take a wooden one then i thought no nylon nylon is gonna be even better that's gonna be nice low frequency impact so i took out that thing and i just looked at him and i also tapped the ground and i said let's go my and then he started running, and I mean, he just ran. But that was my only opportunity for once to have like my, my, my uh, Highlander sword fight in the parking garage. The guy just ran off. I mean, it was a total bummer, but it was cool. <laughs> well, you'll have to put that in your movie. Oh, well, there's cooler stuff in my movie. Uh, I have no doubt. Cooler stuff than that. I have no doubt. No. Well, we close up in uh, a similar way each time. I ask each of the guests, okay. you know, what, what final words, you know, what nugget of wisdom would you want to leave everyone with today? So that's my question to you. How do you want to send us out? Mm. Well, you ask me the question and then I respond or I just go and say, something you just out. go, you just go. How, how, how do you want to end our conversation today for the listeners? I would say really, if you have a good idea, if you have a skill, if you have a talent, yeah, then just go for it, you know? I mean, just do it. Have no fear to fail, you know? The worst cancer in the world is regret, you know? So just do it, and everything is possible. It's just processes in your head. And don't take from no one and don't listen to all the naysayers in your life you know i mean just do it it is possible just visualize it and do it no fear and if you have fear park it but be stronger than the fear and remember you need to want it more than you fear it and then only then you will get what you want talk about a fun ride i had a great time on this episode i mean that when you have a guest that doesn't hold back when they share who they are and what they are, and they just put forth everything that they've got, like I suspect the way he trains and does everything else in life, you get a great episode. And that's what we have today. So thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on. And I look forward to seeing wonderful things from you in the future. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you'll find photos and videos, links, social media, and more from everything we talked about today as well as other stuff that we didn't even talk about today. If you're down to support us and the work that we're doing, you have a few options. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off at whistlekick.com, or you can leave a review, buy a book, help with the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick, or follow us on social media. We're at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. If you see somebody out there wearing whistlekick, 
Say hi. Introduce yourself. Find out how they train and what they train, and maybe you'll make a new friend. And if you have suggestions for the show, I want to hear them. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.